All right. Well, I know we are still gathering here, uh, but let's get started since it's uh, 10 o'clock. Uh, there are a number of us on this call, and so if you're just joining us, um, one, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, it is best practice for us to be able to uh, stay on mute um, there at home on your home computer until um, uh, you're invited to speak. Uh, we have several panelists who are with us, and we will begin with um, hearing about some of the ways that uh, churches here in North Texas are responding uh, to the COVID-19 crisis and um, finding ways for us to be safely um, as much as it is possible in, in service with our neighbors uh, here in North Texas. Uh, another housekeeping item, if you would like to ask a question, if you have something to contribute, uh, ask that you use the chat function um, and you can either send it to me uh, individually or to the whole group uh, about a resource you have found interesting. Um, if you have a question for one of our contributors, that'll just help us manage uh, the noise back and forth um, and help it be a, a smooth call. Um, this will be recorded. And once we um, uh, are able to get it uploaded onto the um, uh, missional outreach uh, subpage on the North Texas Conference website. Uh, you should be able to see it there. Uh, and we are going to also try to have a um, phone call uh, at a later date, perhaps Wednesday or Thursday for those who weren't able to make it. So you'll be able to see this call. Uh, perhaps some of the other contributor, contributors will uh, be able to participate in a later call, and then um, we'll have a call for those that can't be there. All right, well, welcome everyone. Uh, let's pray. Oh God, it is hard to take a breath this morning. There are so many things for us to do as pastors, as leaders, as family members, as just ourselves. There are so many news stories coming out, so many uh, Facebook articles and shares and things for us to keep track of that it is often overwhelming. And so we ask that you. And your spirit give us peace this morning and the ability to open our lungs and our mind and our soul to your breath and so inspire and vivify our life that we might be able to be conduits of your grace in as much as we are able in this time of turmoil of uncertainty and anxiety. We pray that you help us to be the church that resembles you and your serving and outpouring of yourself for others. In your name we pray, O oh God, parent, child, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. So we have a couple, several goals um, for a call today. Uh, just coming from the Center for Missional Outreach perspective, there seem to be three things that we are able to do um, as the Center for Missional Outreach that, um, that we're hoping to um, get out of the call uh, from the center's perspective. Uh, and that one is uh, to be able to uh, connect those that need to be connected. Um, and I think just by having us together this morning and uh, sharing uh, the things that are going on that we are able to facilitate to respond as local churches and individuals to uh, the needs of our neighbors as they arise is one form of connection. But we're looking for any others that need to happen as well. Uh, what encouragement, what does encouragement look like 
for missional responses to COVID-19? How are we as the conference and, um, you know, conference office, but also uh, as a, a collegial body, how are we able to encourage one another in these responses? Because um, we don't know exactly how long uh, these circumstances are going to uh, take place. Um, you know, some studies show that this may uh, take a while for us to get over um, this situation. And so we're going to have to be encouragers of one another uh, and of our uh, people within our sphere. And what can be leveraged? Uh, who is doing what that can be leveraged? What resources do we have that could be leveraged to make, um, to multiply the goodness that we're able to do in our communities? So with that being said, I'd like to introduce to you uh, at least four uh, panelists uh, who agreed to be uh, a part of our conversation today to just share what they are seeing, what they have uh, begun to do um, in terms of response to neighbors and uh, the needs of neighbors and how we can respond as a community of faith. So we have uh, Reverend Holly Bandell, uh, Associate Minister for Mission and Advocacy at First United Methodist here in Dallas. Reverend Mike Bachman, the Community Curator for Union, Union Coffee. Reverend Mitchell Boone, uh, lead pastor at White Rock United Methodist. And uh, we're hopefully hoping that Lisa Stewart, who's the Associate Executive Director uh, for Care and Engagement Ministries at Highland Park, uh, and or uh, Caroline Hazlitt, who's the Outreach Coordinator there at Highland Park for Health Ministries, uh, might be able to be here as well. Andrew, I'm Caroline Hazlett and I'm here. Thank you for joining us. So uh, for those of you who are here on the panel, uh, could you give us a, a thumbnail sketch of uh, how the church in which you're serving is responding uh, to this COVID-19 epidemic? Uh, and Holly, would you lead us off? All right, testing my technology skills today. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's so good to see some of your faces. I, um, I don't know about you, but it, it's kind of been a roller coaster for me, as with many of you, on, on how these responses are going. And with a shelter in place order here in Dallas um, um, coming up this evening, I know that there is still even more change to come and my kids and dog are in the background. So I'm, if I have to mute quickly, you'll know why. But um, I do also, I want everyone to know, I was out of town last week. And so many of the responses were initiated by um, Andy Stoker and our staff team at First Methodist. And I'm glad to represent them. I, I, I think um, Andy is on the phone um, on the call as well. And so would invite him to share his um, thoughts on this. Um, two, um, I think we've there's been responses toward members, which is also a missional response to really care for those who are most affected in our church um, family and kind of extended family of the church, and then also um, missional outreach to our our partners and mission in the community. And so, out of those conversations. Um, there have been several responses that have come to the fore and we're just experiencing a lot of um, need for care for our own congregation and members and particularly those seniors who are, are, are really sheltering in place in, in a profound way. Um, and I think it's both encouragement and resources then to our missional partners who are continuing and the need is great. For example, um, we served at Crossroads Community Services um, in Dallas over the weekend. And they said that just in the you know, last um, few days of the week, they served 32 new families. Um, and, and that's a lot in, in terms of people that are coming brand new to the table needing the basics of food. And so we know that for our partners like Wesley Ranklin, Dallas Bethlehem Center, 
um, Crossroads, Austin Street Shelter, all of our homeless partners that serve our homeless neighbors, that these needs are just increasing because of the restrictions on how people usually operate. So I'll stop there. And Andrew, is there anything else that you want me to address at this point? Uh, you know, one follow-up question is, you know, how are you going about listening um, for need areas that are arising? Well, um, there were some strategic contacts made again by um, Dr. Stoker and other members of the staff to our partners last week because we knew the needs would be changing rapidly. And once we reached out, we kind of got a flood of information, everything from what if, you know, you know, kind of sewing and quilt groups could start making masks for um, first responders. What if, you know, so I, my inbox is still full of, after we began to reach out, people responding, what if we made, what if, do you have a group that can make blankets for maybe people who are on the verge of homelessness or are now homeless because they can't work an hourly job? And so just, and, and then I would just say too, um, because of our connectivity in the community, we began to also get a, a lot of responses around advocacy. And so for our city council to make um, strategic decisions around um, cutting off utilities. And so Faith for Dallas and a group of clergy here in Dallas were advocating for extensions for those who may be on the brink of, of you losing utility access. Um, and also advocacy at the state and federal level for funding. I think what we're gonna see is that our, our, our ongoing um, struggle with equity in our communities is gonna continue to widen as we have disruptions in the way people normally operate. And so um, I think that as we think about the ways we can serve people, advocacy, even at the federal level, is really important because that's where some of this funding is going to come from that's going to um, affect um, um, different populations in a variety of ways. And what we know is any time that there is a disruption in the way we work in the United States, um, and this would certainly be one of those times that we tend to see those who are already disproportionately um, disenfranchised and um, less resourced become more so. And so in order to counteract that, we need advocacy. I've gotten two or three um, plights even last night and this morning to call my representatives to advocate for um, DACA recipients to be able to get some of this federal money to um, for hourly workers, for um, arts people who are now out of jobs. So just different ways that we can advocate on um, the state and federal level as well. That's great, thank you, Holly. Andrew, may I, may I jump in? Please. Uh, Holly did a great job of describing uh, our work last week. Let me also describe what we're hearing from nonprofits, nursing homes, and others, and some ways that maybe pastors who are on the call uh, can can reach out and, and help and support. Um, when we were making our initial calls, and this is probably what many of you have discovered, is that nonprofits were having, um, they, they were going about business as usual, and then they were trying to implement social distancing, uh, glove usage, et cetera. And then uh, CDC on Wednesday uh, came out with some protocols on how long items had to be quarantined before they could be distributed. Um, so it, it, it was a, a complex confluence of challenges all at once. For example, this is something, um, something that, that could be very easily done uh, in local churches is um, for our members or if your church is in a neighborhood with a, a nursing home uh, or an adult retirement center, 
uh, we set up care packages. Uh, we created 150 care packages with a, toilet, a roll of toilet paper and tissue paper, right? Colorful tissue paper, a uh, package of Kleenex, uh, some peanut butter crackers, um, a bottle of water. Our kids wrote a note and then our uh, day, daycare, our day school, um, uh, painted the bags. Well, we delivered them to CC Young um, last week and they're in quarantine for a week because of the paper materials potentially carrying the virus. So uh, just know that there are things that potentially we can, we can do ongoing. Secondly, uh, my spouse is a nurse at Children's Medical Center and uh, there was a, a Facebook message uh, sent to her while she was at work over the weekend and several members of our congregation started delivering to the front desk at the hospital, started delivering snacks for nurses and doctors, respiratory therapists. Um, that's really low hanging fruit and something potentially uh, you could do on your own pastors with you know, your business card or some kind of note given to them. Um, I'll, I'll, second, uh, I'll second what Holly said so excellently is that um, though we might have these paper products and distribution of food, et cetera, remember on the back end of this, uh, of this crisis, we're going to be looking at an economic challenge, uh, potentially like we've never seen before, especially for those who are most vulnerable. Any way that you can stay connected with that advocacy, I, I think I saw J.D. Allen post on the chat uh, that there is a texasimpact.org link that you can find resources on. Obviously, um, Holly's a great resource. I'd be glad to help as well, but um, that advocacy piece is critical. Uh, this is compassion in action. Uh, yes, we're gonna do stuff, but hopefully we'll, we'll be inspired to be differently after this as well. Andrew, thank you for organizing this call. I so appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Uh, Mike Bachman, are you on the line? I am. All right. Well, thank you, Mike. What a, if you could give us a, a thumbnail sketch of, of what unions do and that'd be great. Sure. Well, I mean, we know we're in times of uh, crisis. FEMA recognizes two, two things that identify the, uh, you know, in areas in state of crisis. The first is if Waffle House is closed. Um, and, uh, and the second is if Andy Stoker is not wearing a tie. And so it's, it's clear to all of us that um, there's, there's work for us to do in the world. Um, <laughs> but uh, a couple of the things that um, we've got rolling at Union, um, you know, we have access to a younger demographic who's less likely to be in high risk situations. Uh, and so uh, to help accommodate with that, we've created a volunteer page um, and I can share what some of this stuff looks like if that's all right with um, the host. Um, so this is the sheet that we put together and it was a quick Google form, um, where people can kind of fill in their information, identify the areas of interest where they can serve. Um, and, uh, and so then we've got a team of people who have access to the backside of this to see what the responses have been. Um, and then they use this, uh, growing list of needs that we've identified the city of Dallas to kind of match whatever it is that um, people have said they're interested in helping with and then connecting in with that. So that we're basically like a pass through um, middleman organization uh, to connect volunteers to needs in the city. Um, we're, it's starting to pick up more traction. It started out really slow. I was kind of disappointed, uh, but now we've got um, about 50 or 60 people that we've connected directly into volunteer opportunities. Um, and hopefully that list is growing as people get a little more stir crazy um, they might be willing to go out a bit more or as the shelter in place order comes in they might be less willing um, we're you know just kind of kind of wait and see how that goes uh, but on the back end of this we basically just have uh, a rotation of people who take a day at a time so if I'm on duty today I'll take any of the new ones that come in today and make sure to connect them into an organization and then once a week, we're sending out an email to everybody who's um, signed up to volunteer. Um, so that's one of the things that we've been doing. Uh, also, um, 
just as a point of awareness, especially for folks in the Dallas area, uh, there is a makeshift homeless camp that's set up um, uh, in front of the downtown library and sort of uh, in the plaza for City Hall uh, with people who have been displaced because all the homeless shelters have cut their population and number of beds in half in order to keep people separated from each other. So then uh, there's now this kind of big, well, there is this big overflow challenge that's there. So um, Oakland and Union went down yesterday and brought tacos for everybody. And we had enough for a hundred and it was gone in 15 minutes. Um, so there's a, there's a definite need that's going on downtown and my hunches and other places as a result. Um, Oakland's continued to, they actually got a specific request from the city of Dallas not to shut down uh, despite the shelter in place because of the work that they do with um, unsheltered neighbors. So just kind of have an enhanced awareness about that, um, I think a helpful thing. Uh, the last thing that I would add that we're trying to figure out what to do with, and maybe someone out there has a good idea on a way to utilize it. We shuttered our food truck operations in December because we just couldn't make it work financially. It was, there are a whole bunch of reasons, but um, in any case, the food truck's just kind of sitting out in Walnut Hills parking lot uh, right now. And um, so it would take us a couple days to get it up and operational. Uh, but if there are some sort of missional needs, some sort of opportunity or way that a church could utilize that resource um, of a fully functional food truck, it would take very little to get it running again. Um, and if that church can provide some of the financial resources necessary, um, let us know because we would love for it to be used and deployed in a time like this. We just haven't figured out or, or really found where it makes sense to utilize it. Um, and there are some challenges that'll need to be figured out with that, like supply chain right now is touch and go. Um, but uh, it is an option if folks have ideas on ways to utilize it. So those are the things that we've got cranking in terms of mission. Well, that's great, Mike. Um, are you, in terms of folks that are um, becoming displaced, uh, has, and this goes for any of the rest of you who are on uh, who might be able to speak to this, uh, is there a worry about some of our, um, you know, most vulnerable neighbors? I know there is an eviction pause. I'm not sure if that's at a state level, um, but especially those who, um, maybe undocumented, maybe most at risk for uh, being pushed out. Um, um, of their homes kind of without the enforcement mechanisms in place. Hey, Andrew, just a clarification. Uh, the, the eviction, uh, the stop to evictions is in fact now statewide. It okay. did our, our um, the Supreme Court issued that ruling late last week following after our own justice of the peace here in dallas who had taken action and, and as holly mentioned very proud of faith forward dallas and faith in texas for jumping on that and, and encouraging uh leaders to do that by the way let me just say one of the things that we i believe should be advocating for is to extend that not only for evictions but also utility disconnections 90 days after whenever the shelter in place ends. If you're a hourly worker, a uh, low wage worker, you're not gonna have funds to catch up on the first day. So the justice would say that we really need to push our leaders to extend that past whenever the shelter in place ends. That can be a conversation for another time, but I would love for us to all uh, work together on that as things go forward. Eric, um, I hope you and JD will be able to keep us um, keep us abreast of what um, organizing efforts might be going on around that issue. Um, I can identify another group that doesn't, depending on what circles you in, you're in, you may have awareness of or not, and that's folks in the performing arts, right? So freelance artists, actors, directors, folks like that, who's all of their income dried up in one week. Um, you know, uh, one example is a friend of mine who uh, was supposed to play a lead role in a show in Knoxville, Tennessee. So he quit his job. Um, and two days before he was supposed to move out to Knoxville, they canceled the show. 
um, and now he has zero income and revenue. And that's a story that I'm seeing repeated again and again and again and again. Folks in the theater world who, you know, immediately had all of their income dried up. Um, so, um, you know, it's just another kind of underserved group and within that network, people are talking with each other and trying to figure out ways to support each other, but um, in any ways that we're able to encourage that, um, employ freelance musicians to do cool things in the midst of this it makes a huge difference. Um, and uh, I'm happy to connect to a long list of actors. Um, along with that though, I'd also say if you just want something that's good for your soul, join the Facebook group Quarantined Cabaret. Um, it was started by uh, a person who is an actor here in Dallas, and now it's got like 15,000 people in it. And, uh, art, you know, artists can't stop creating. Um, so they keep doing performances and just posting it on there. Anything from like 94-year-old women dancing, like every morning she posts something, uh, to uh, Marcus Womack uh, and singing with his wife and posting it up there. So check it out. It's, it's pretty great. I would not turn down one more helper for our group. We're keeping the group pretty small. Oh, uh, can we put your um, computer on mute there, Norma? I'm one of the helpers, and I'm not the strongest. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks, Mike. And are there any other um, needs that you're seeing um, arise? I know you're, you've got a lot of connections around the community as well. Um, that we might just not know about, like the the actors and, and performers? Um, of course, service industry is another group that's struggling right now. I mean, at Union, we're struggling with that every day. Our sales dropped to a third of what they were overnight. Um, and uh, that's true across the board. Just about everybody I'm talking to in the restaurant industry um, is seeing their unless they have a heavy drive through business before this happened. Um, and even the ones with a heavy drive through business, like McDonald's, their sales have dropped a third. Um, ours have dropped, and most other places have dropped two thirds. Um, so anybody in the service industry is struggling. And uh, I was having a conversation with someone who's a church planner up in Minneapolis, and he was talking about ways that they're hiring service industry folks to do things for local shelters and stuff like that. And the way he talked about it is he said, it's like trying to figure out ways to have $1 really count as $4 um, because so many different people along the supply chain benefit from it. Uh, and so whatever can be done to hire local caterers, to um, hire a restaurant to provide food for a particular need or, um, you know, coffee for whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, hey, we're here. Um, it's, uh, um, it, it makes a big difference, especially if you can get beyond the big chains. Um, Starbucks is gonna be fine. McDonald's is gonna be fine. Um, but it's, it's folks in other areas that are really struggling and laying off and closing. Um, Cultivar Coffee closed one of their locations, laid off three quarters of their workers. Um, you know, it's, we're seeing that all across the industry. So that's another group that desperately needs help. There isn't an easy solution, but good Lord, any way that you can use them is great. And uh, with that, let me trans transition over to uh, Caroline, are you still with us? I think she may have uh, dropped off. Um, HP UMC, Highland Park UM, UMC is, um, I believe, using their uh, catering service that's normally in-house to uh, add employees who have been laid off and provide meals for um, uh, those who are really vulnerable, I think, through uh, Wesley Rankin and Dallas Bethlehem Center and some other you know, partner nonprofits. And so um, when she gets back on, I'll look for more information from her. Uh, Mitchell Boone, uh, could you let us know just kind of what, what all is going on with uh, White Rock and? Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, White Rock is, is kind of tucked back into a neighborhood. Um, and so we've been really uh, serious about how we connect our neighbors. And White Rock has a unique kind of population 
or congregation essentially like we have a bunch of folks that are like well into retirement in their late 70s 80s early 90s and then we have a bunch of uh younger folks who um may be in a lower risk population and so initially we created something similar uh to what mike created and i'll show you all what that looks like um once i can share my screen um so you're I don't know if I can do this. Let me see. I'll I'll just send out our website. So that way uh, you can peruse that at your leisure. Um, one of the things that's been uh, helpful in that is we've been able to connect folks directly to uh, other folks in our congregation. And then we are approached by our city council member to try to expand that effort. Uh, 75228 is one of the zip codes we're very active in. And um, 75228 has the highest um, number of senior citizens in Dallas. In fact, 75218, where White Rock is, and 75228, where Owenwood is, uh, makes up 40% of senior populations, uh, the population of seniors in, in the city of Dallas. And so there's a great concern that a lot of our seniors in our area um, who are already not taking advantage of SNAP benefits, uh, government programs that help um, bring them food, uh, seniors who live in the midst of a food desert already, um, the strain of this is going to um, uh, really create a food crisis for our oldest and most vulnerable. And until uh, VNA uh, figures out a way maybe to step into that gap or uh, the city decides to, uh, we've been approached by the city to help kind of uh, shape some of that early response. And so we are making this kind of connector uh, um, kind of public facing over the next few days. And it's all up in the air, obviously, with the shelter in place guidelines and things like that. But we do think it's important that we kind of interface with the city because they're going to know what the needs are here on the ground. And so um, that connector, essentially, the church is operating as a conduit. So it's real simple. Someone says, hey, I'm willing to do X, Y, and Z. And then we have someone who fills out, says, I need X, Y, and Z done. And then we just put them in contact with each other. Um, and so it's, it's, a, uh, it's a way for us to try to build some relationship and rely on the, the um, network that we have in East Dallas. Um, another thing that we've been doing is we've been vetting a lot of our news for our folks, uh, especially some of our older folks who, um, who may be um, kind of overwhelmed with the amount of information that is being sent uh, to them by a variety of people in their lives. And so we, we've tried to tell our folks at uh, who are part of our church, hey, look, like, here's our own resource page. We're also doing that for families, too, like stuff that we just think thinks worth uh, getting in front of people. And we're using folks in our congregation who are experts around this stuff to help us vet it. And then so we've created a whole resource page. All of that is available. Uh, Y'all can totally rip it and pass it out. We think that there's good stuff there. Um, and then finally, one of the things we're also doing is we're trying to give, I'm trying to give a platform to, to actual experts, not uh, the church really, we're not experts in public health. We're not experts in uh, pandemics. Uh, we are, uh, we probably all know experts though, either in our church or within the communities in which we serve. And so each day I'm sitting down for 20, 30 minutes with folks who know what they're talking about and asking them, how can the church step into the gap? We've got a wide variety of responses. Uh, Dan Mitschke, our trustee I, uh, for DISD, uh, is asking folks to send gift cards straight to uh, DISD headquarters so they can distribute them out to families in need. Uh, Paula Blackman, our council member, is uh is really starting an effort to promote local businesses and I can send out that link as well. And so we're trying to play the um, moderator and the conduit and also recognize that um, our main focus is our folks that are part of our congregation who are going to be really affected by this and our immediate neighbors because that's where we have the relationships. And then I would say, you know, the final piece is um, then supporting nonprofits who have all the relationships. So, uh, Right now, uh, the best way I, I know to support City Square is to send them cash. And so, like, we, these nonprofits are going to just be uh, deeply impacted and they're going to experience the same spike as we keep hearing about hospitals flatten the curve. It's also important to flatten the curve so we can continue to help our nonprofits meet their needs that um, 
that exist. And so um, I, uh, I think that one of the things we should really consider doing is uh, if we have any income whatsoever, uh, I'm looking through all of our, uh, you know, our restricted accounts right now, and we're making some important decisions about uh, where that money goes. And we're going to actually start releasing some of those funds this week to nonprofits that we think need it. Because we'll be okay, maybe, I don't know. But we know that like, if City Square's food pantry closes, that's going to have huge impacts on the southern sector of Dallas and really citywide. Um, and so we need to also make sure that we're funding as we're asking for money, because I'm also asking my congregation to continue to give, and I'll be very uh, specific about that over the next few weeks. Uh, we can't just like stop that flow of cash into the church. I think we've got to find creative ways to push it back out because um, some of these nonprofits are uh, not only doing great public uh, health work, but they're also uh, just standing in the gaps and they have been for a really long time. So I hope we continue to, to find ways to support nonprofits with our money. Hey, Andrew, this is Edlin. Do you mind if I just jump in and share something real quick? Please. Uh, so I was on the phone with TMF this morning, uh, checking on what they might do to help church. And this goes right to your point, Mitchell. Um, they should be coming out this afternoon. They are offering either the option for churches to go six months, to do interest only or to do a three month deferral completely uh, for your mortgage uh, payments. Uh, so we're having a meeting with our single board tonight to leverage one of those. I don't know which one we'll do, but for those of us who have our debt carried by TMF, this is an option that they're giving that'll help Mitchell with what you're talking about, freeing up some funds. Right. So we're still gonna be able to do what we need to do. Just want to share that. Thank you for that, Edlin. Um, yeah, we're going to have to get creative uh, with our response here. Um, Caroline, I believe, is back on the line. Caroline, would you share kind of a thumbnail sketch of Highland Park's response, and especially um, with what you're doing with, with providing food using uh, your catering service? Yeah, sorry, I got dropped earlier. Um, so we're, we're kind of doing, we're doing a lot of things similar to, to other people in the sense that we're certainly reaching out to and ministering to our own um, vulnerable population. What's been going on there is the um, pastoral care department and our adult ministries have gotten together and we've, um, well, let me start. We, we created a sign up that people can go onto our website and sign up if they want to help. And they can say ways that they want to help. Those volunteers that are coming in, we are background checking them before we're putting them in touch with anybody who is a vulnerable population, whether within or outside our congregation. So that's happening first. Um, there's been a phone, um, a phone system set up where we've contacted um, all of our more vulnerable members. So we started with the 80 plus group and then kind of going down and all that to kind of part, part of this is pastoral and part of it is needs assessment. So um, the callers have been trained to, um, to give a pastoral um, and reassuring presence with a, a script that was helped that was written by the pastoral care ministries. And um, so we do want to, we want to be sure that we're keeping in contact with that group of people. Um, then we have other then we then we're working at on um, reaching out to our entire congregation and there's actually a phone tree going on where literally yes we have 16,000 members <laughs> reaching out by phone trying to make sure people know that the church is there for them letting them know that we can help and letting them know that we have opportunities for them to help if they're not in one of the vulnerable groups um and like most of you reaching out and working with our uh, partners that we've already worked with and a few new ones and um, like most of you did, we reached out to them as quickly as we could and have an ongoing spreadsheet of what their needs are. So there's a collection point of items. Uh, we're making some emergency grants as needed. We too are, are doing some fundraising specifically for this purpose. And then the program that Andy is um, referring to for meals, we have a commercial kitchen in our church and there's uh, Preston Hollow Catering, basically that, you know, they lease our kitchen, you know, we use them for our in-house catering and daycare and stuff, but they also are just their own business. And Paul uh, Rasmussen, our senior pastor, um, came up with this fabulous idea last week when um, 
Preston Hollow is going to have to simply lay off everyone. Um, and he said, what if we use this to help meet some needs in the community? So um, basically, um, a number of organizations that we work with in the community, Austin Street Center, um, the bridge um, downtown, um, some of the um, lower income housing places, Dickinson Place, Tyler Street, uh, Genesis, places like that that are really needing assistance with food. Um, the kitchen is ramping up and doing, right now I think it's about 1,200 um, box lunches a day. And um, they have the ability to, to crank that up if we need them to. We're just, we're kind of following it along as we need to. Um, we had a lot of members sign up that were willing to do, uh, to drive for people, whether to pick up groceries or pharmacy, meeting those basic needs, but also can help deliver these meals to the organizations um, that are in need. Um, so it's been a really, um, a really cool thing to watch how quickly it popped up um, the number of people that are being served, as well as the fact that Preston Hall has been able to hire some people that have lost um, jobs in the service sector. So, um, so that's been really, really huge and it's ongoing. Um, uh, Lisa Stewart is also on this call. Lisa, jump in if you can think of things. Um, another thing, we were approached by the Red Cross because there's a, um, an emergency situation with blood right now. Most of their blood drives have been canceled because many of them were being held at schools that are closed, churches that are closed, that kind of thing. And um, so we're working with them to get a blood drive going. It'll probably happen for a couple of days next week. Um, Red Cross has some really amazing uh, protocols that they've gotten into place really quickly to make sure that we're honoring um, you know, both the order and social distancing and, and safety. So I think that's that's a positive thing. Of course, it'll be open to the entire community. Um, Lisa, can you think of anything else I need to be saying? Now, Carolyn, I think you, you've got it. Um, the only other thing I can think of is that we're trying to connect um, our youth, our um, going to be working with a group called United to Learn that su supports um, DISD schools and they're going to be doing some educational videos for our um, for, for the DISD to use with their students and that's something that anybody can do so if anybody would like information about that you can just shoot me an email and I'll connect you to United to Learn you make the videos like there'll be teenagers teaching elementary school kids how to play soccer or you know something like that um, and the other thing we're doing is having phone pals with some of our friends at Dickinson Place and other places. So that's the only thing I can think of, Caroline, that we're doing that you didn't mention. We're trying to, as we work with our community partners, um, much like what many of you have been saying, I, we're, we're really looking at how can we step into that area of, of people that are clearly already, you know, working with a lot of our, our homeless neighbors, but also those people that are right on the edge that this crisis is going to throw them from being on the edge into poverty and seeing what can we do to try to, to try to minimize that effect. Um, and, and how can we help to advocate, you know, for, um, for policy, both within the church and, and within the government that are, that will help these people yesterday serving, um, meals down at uh, City Square to the homeless population. It was so obvious that, you know, how many people in that community are not really aware of what's going on fully. I wanted to just walk up to everyone and say, please spread apart. <laughs> um, but um, but um, those are the people that are gonna be left out by whatever these stimulus packages are that are coming out that are really designed for people in the normal workforce. So many, whether they're homeless or even just hourly employees, the people that Mike Bachman was talking about that are going to be left out of, of those things. I think that's where the church needs to come in and step in. Um, and then just yesterday, as people were going through the line, you know, they got squirted with hand sanitizer before they went through and we gave them hygiene packets on the way out that had hand sanitizer and, and wipes and things, trying to educate as much as we can just in that little way. But I, I think just trying to keep our minds, ears and eyes open to the ways that we can intervene with that particularly vulnerable population. I think that's all I've got.
Thank you all so much. That, that was incredibly informative. Um, I believe Mike wanted to um, float an idea. Yeah, so, um, and Carolyn mentioning Genesis Women's Shelter reminded me of a thing that I wanted to just kind of put out there and check in with clergy about. Um, I haven't had a conversation with her yet, but I was going to reach out to Paige Flink, who's the executive director for Family Place. Um, you know, the domestic violence shelters are very close to being beyond capacity um, because, and with shelter in place, it's anticipated that it's going to get worse. Um, because when people are in closed quarters and so forth, they have much more instances of, of domestic violence taking place and they're understaffed right now. Um, one of the things I'm kind of curious about is if we can, and I don't know where they would be on this, but I wanted to see if clergy would be open to this. You know, confidentiality is important. Knowing that it's a safe place is important, things like that. There's a part of me that kind of wonders if clergy across, say, the the Metroplex area um, were to offer to take in one family or one victim, um, a slash survivor. Uh, if there's the option that, you know, because we do have a sense of confidentiality, because there are these other elements in place, if they end up being at a point of being extremely stressed as a shelter, if that's an option um, on a temporary basis. And I don't know what their response will be or not, but um, I wonder if we personally as pastors can provide a certain measure of sanctuary in the midst of that. Um, so if folks have thoughts or if they wanna you know, chat about that, Michael. shoot me a message. Michael, it's Kathy Sweeney from um, Arapaho. At Agape Resource and Assistance Center in Collin County, um, we're being um, cautious as to what we bring in, but we serve women and children and um, we have a couple of um, units that we're trying to fill right now. So if there are um, non-male-led families, um, they can give us a call and we can do an online uh, application kind of and see if it's something that we can bring in right now. Our staff is really, uh, we wanna make sure that we can serve them, but um, it's possible that we can bring them in. So. Um, if they want to do that, um, they can call us at, you know, it's silly. I use my phone number, my cell number. They can call us at 469-814-0453. Uh, Thanks, Kathy. I'll, be, I'll pass that along. Hey, may I ask a, just a logistical question that maybe somebody knows? In this shelter-in-place time, does anybody know what the rules are going to be on hospital visitation for clergy? I haven't heard anything specifically about that. I just wondered if any of you all know. I've heard no, no hospital visitation. They, they may make an allowance if it's time of death, but I've heard, I've heard none. I don't know if that's still the case. We've had we had an incredibly difficult time getting into the hospital for one of our women who was in the hospital over the weekend and we had to pretty much beg and plead and sign all kinds of papers just to see one person. And that was it. Uh, that was in Plano. In Collin County right now, it's one each um, patient has one person that they can have with them and that includes family. So there are no pastors allowed in at all. Um, hospice situations, what we understand is that if they are at the end of life and their reference is actively dying, that they will allow family to go in. But our families are not even allowed to be with hospice patients. They're family members who are in residential type hospice settings. I think it, it, if it, Andrew, if you guys find official information about that coming out from our government sources, that would be a very helpful thing y'all could share conference wide because I bet there's going to be a lot of confusing different information coming out. Right, and I imagine also you know different medical facilities will have their own own rules, and this will just be difficult to navigate. But we'll um, we'll try to let people know about that. All right. Um, I believe Holly Bandell wanted to also chime in about uh, schools. 
Yeah, I want to just follow up. So many of our congregations have school partnerships, and and even though school isn't in session, I'm I'm imagining there are some needs there, even if they're needs of encouragement. And I know that just looking at my my social media feeds and things like that, that people are offering to help in many different ways in terms of teachers helping students and retired teachers helping, you know, and offering help. I think there could be a way that the church churches could be conduits in terms of matching the needs of students at home with retired teachers and people who are sheltering in place and things like that. So um, I've also, I would just encourage you, if you have a school partner, to reach out to your principal, to send a note of encouragement and to elicit what needs might be there. I know in Dallas ISD, there are doing kind of carpool lines for um, free, free breakfast and lunch since every Dallas ISD student is doing that. Um, I've gotten requests because I'm a volunteer at Dallas ISD to come and be one of the people that carries the food from the school to the trunk of the car, um, limiting contact. Um, they're not allowing, you know, it's just going to be a drive through line. Um, and those start today. And so I'm going to try that out in the next week to see how that works. But it just occurs to me that every school district is going to have to meet some of those needs and that there might be some low contact ways that we can add encouragement. We're also reaching out about we have kind of teachers that we kind of adopt over the course of a year and how can we make those connections. Teachers are going to, and ministers are going to be working. And so it seems to me that some of those things uh, of encouragement and figuring out and taking the lead of our principals at our partner schools might be a really good way for the church to respond in those settings. So hope if you have a church partnership, you will, you will do that. Thank you, Holly. Our um, uh, two of our colleagues have been talking about um, internet access and technology, and I think this is geared toward uh, students who may be uh, without technology or internet access at their um, homes. And so, um, uh, Charles Chuck Church has uh, talked about uh, opening access to the Wi-Fi. Uh, to students and others who are um, staying in the parking lot and so are socially distanced but can use the internet access and they've had uh, requests for that um, and Nick brings up you know if we have technology sitting around that's not being used uh, there may be some ways uh, moving ahead for us to deploy that to areas that that could be really useful um, A lot of great ideas here. So um, I want to just take some time for um, uh, questions. Um, Freddie, if you have questions or comments, please use that in the chat bar. Uh, Freddie, would you like to share your idea about hotels? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, what the reason why I'm somewhat familiar with the hotels is my sister-in-law works for one of the major hotels, and she's saying they are just basically dead. Without the traveling that's taking place, um, they they basically don't have really anybody in the hotels, and they, like everybody understands, the food, the hospitality industry is hard to get, and you know they went down all the way down to like two uh, young ladies that are are doing the rooms now because they have nobody there. So since we're hearing that there is a lot of um, domestic violence increased with people being at home and in these tight situations now and running out of space, that maybe those agencies or people that we might know who is in that field, that we recommend that they check with some of the hotels and see if they would be interested in, in hosting uh, some of these uh, domestic violence situations to help out in that endeavor. Great. Th thank you, Freddie. That's a good idea. And if, um, if you don't mind, uh, if there are those of you who are kind of circling around this a similar idea, I'd love to kind of get you together to have follow-up conversations about 
some of these areas like domestic violence and um, and how to help, um, especially Kathy, since you're you're in the thick of it there with your daily work. Um, okay, so we have uh, Chuck Church is also mentioning that we have uh, PCsforpeople.com has some cheap options for computers and internet access, and that's a good referral. What other questions do y'all have? Hey, Andrew, I would love, um, we're in the good neighbor experiment at mm -hmm. First Church, and I have a small group that we've been talking over the last, oh, I don't know, four or five months about what it means to really be a neighbor to our actual neighbors. And so, and, and they, this curriculum kind of provides, um, of the neighboring movement kind of provides curriculum around how do you begin to neighbor your actual neighbors as a disciple. And it seems to me that this, this idea could really be helpful. And since we are kind of more at home, at least I am more at home and maybe more in tune with what's actually going on in our neighborhoods. And so I am just looking for ideas that maybe people are doing with their actual neighbors, even in with the social distancing. So in the curriculum, it talks about dropping notes of encouragement to people or um, preparing a treat to give to your neighbors. Um, you know, things like that, that would not necessarily require, you know, face-to-face, -face, you know, contact. I think also to kind of figure out how to, you know, if we have phone numbers of neighbors or we see them across the street, is there, a, are there ways that we can um, be really good neighbors? And so some of you probably have real active neighborhoods. Some of our, um, our experience, um, has been that some neighborhoods aren't real active with one another, but this might be an opportunity to to grow that in a way that is still safe and and, and compliant with what's needed for the greater good. So I'd love some ideas about that um, if people have them. Um, this is Mark Corzell. Uh, we've done the neighboring program too. One resource is the um, is called 52 Weeks of Neighboring. You may be part of that already. And they have been, uh, the associate group has been sending out weekly ideas. If y'all would like to be a part of that, you don't have to be part of the neighboring curriculum in order to do that. I'll go ahead and post the website so you can sign up for those and you can get weekly things. They have been tailoring those now to the current climate that we're in. And so you can get their ideas and share those with your congregation uh, about how to do that. We ordered a huge thing of uh, sidewalk chalk, and we're going to be putting bags together and delivering it to all of our neighborhood kids and just saying, like, spread love, not germs. And um, we've also found that getting Zoom calls with our kids has really increased kind of that neighborhood community. We're used to yeah. hosting a lot of kids, so a couple times a week we'll get together and let all the kids get on FaceTime and, and talk. So those have been helpful for community building. Monica, could you uh, could you share about what you're doing? Sure. So um, actually, this came up after a member of our youth committed suicide in December. We created. Um, five variations of lawn signs that say things like, um, you know, you are enough, um, just do the next right thing, um, you can do hard things, things like that, um, and have our church logo on them. And um, we have a place on our website, people can order whichever variation they want, and they're double sided. Um, and we found a lot more folks wanting those now, especially as more and more people are out walking. Um, but we've kind of mm -hmm. spread those through. You know, we have folks from H Highland Park, University Park, Lake Highlands, Richardson, kind of all over. So um, not necessarily our direct neighborhood, but they've been filtering through our members to different neighborhoods around kind of North and East Dallas. Thank you, Monica. That's that's really good. And uh, Michelle, you're uh, mentioning something that may be really helpful for 
uh, when we're sharing uh, meals with um, or delivering meals. So we have seven students at Paris Junior College who are still living in the dorms for various reasons. Um, sorry, my cat is a mess. Um, <laughs> but they have suggestions about contact-free delivery where you um, will place the meal, if it's a warm meal, putting it into like um, an ice chest or something and leaving it on the front um, doorstep and ringing the doorbell and leaving or texting them or calling them. And so by leaving something and then not having that exchange, especially if you have like individual deliveries at homes without having that contact. That's great, thanks. And uh, and Nick, Nick McCray. Hope oh, are you there, Nick? You're muted, Nick. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just I just put in the comments that uh, my mother in law, uh, she's she's Roman Catholic. She lives in, in New Orleans. She was telling me about a Catholic priest uh, somewhere near New Orleans there who uh, had been sitting out sort of on that little concrete pad, like uh, sort of driveway out by the sidewalk in a chair, and just sort of drew this big chalk square around his chair, you know, like uh, six feet away, and put it in some, another chair or two outside of it, and he put up a sign that was like, uh, you know, need to talk, have questions want to give confession, right? So, uh, and apparently he's been getting a lot of, you know, a lot of folks who actually do want to come and, you know, be as face-to-face -face as they can <laughs> with, uh, with a spiritual leader and, and, and talk and, um, and uh, yeah. So anyway, that was just a kind of an inspiring idea. I don't know how practical that is given our locations or, or, you know, stuff, but that's a, I don't know, that was a kind of an inspiration to me. Thanks, Nick. Uh, and Kathy, I want to get back, Kathy Sweeney, I want to get back to a question you had. Uh, do, do the new ordinance or declarations apply to all landlords in pausing eviction, or is it just those that are publicly funded? Eric, might you know that? Yeah, it's, <clears throat> excuse me, it's all evictions, all, all any rental situation, not simply public funded. And there are also, um, there's also been some movement on uh, stopping utility cutoffs, water, electricity, gas, that kind of thing as well. That's a little more complicated because that's not uh, directly controlled by, uh, evictions are county led. So wherever you are in whatever county you're in, check with your county commissioners about uh, making sure that they understand that that's the law right now. No evictions during this crisis. And is that a state thing or a, a county by county thing? Yes, it was a, it was a county thing. Initially, our JPs and county commissioners here in Dallas County did it. Some other counties did it. The state Supreme Court has now issued a ruling making this an effective statewide decision. But as I, I pointed out a little earlier, it only extends to the end of the crisis date. I think those of us who are clergy really need to continue advocating to extend that further because especially low wage hourly workers the very people we've been talking about service workers musicians actors all those folks they're not going to have money on the first day to catch up right. they're going to need several months more afterwards to catch up and so i think we don't have to do that today because this crisis is going to go on for a while but at some point in the next month or so we're going to have to go back and press people, I think, to extend that farther than just the final date of the crisis. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Please, uh, please keep, keep us informed about that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one question from uh, Laura about uh, the implications of having meals delivered, um, prepared in someone else's kitchen and delivered to another home. Does anyone know the implications of that? or rules that would be good? The advice we got for that was that if people want to do it, they should do it on their own. That as a church, we should, because of health department rules, that we can't, that we can't do that, but people can certainly do it on their own. We have stopped that at this point and just encouraged people to order from restaurants or other things to deliver foods, but we have stopped any services 
any of our meals that we normally do, the meal trains that we normally do. And so I just wanted to know if anybody was doing anything else because people can think that they are okay and then deliver something and realize that they're not. Mm. And with uh, 12 step groups, we have some, uh, some questions and some ideas that are being passed around about um, how, to, how to assist our 12 step groups who normally meet in person, um, often in a circle uh, together. Um, how are people finding their way to support those groups? So one thing we've done is to set up our Zoom and give access to our 12-step leaders so they can meet their groups via Zoom. Uh, and that's one option we might do. They can do that on their own, obviously, but we'd like to provide that to them so they can continue to meet at, at their regular times online. We actually haven't told them they can't come. I don't. This is a real moral quandary for me because I don't feel like I can tell a 12-step group not to meet. They've got access to our building. They can get in whenever they want. We've left that up to our leaders at this point because I feel like that can be a life or death decision for people. But we're also going to allow them this online option as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to tell them they can't meet. I, I don't know. I'd be interested to hear what other people think about that. Any other 12-step ideas, offerings? Oh, great. We've got a number of resources uh, that are posted in our chat function, and we will try to get those posted uh, via our website. Hmm. Yes, Diana, uh, you had a question, uh, a further question about schools. Schools. Can you say really, more about that? Yeah, I just really have an idea in having lots of teachers in my life. So what, what uh, some teachers are doing that churches may want to do, even if they don't have a partner like, um, like at, at First, First Church Dallas, uh, some teachers for elementary children, pretty young elementary, they are... Um, doing a Zoom with their class. And the thing that they need help from the church is to have someone that can do reading. And so some parents, uh, not parents, some persons from the church who are agreeing to read like Tuesday at 10 o'clock. And they'll be there every Tuesday at 10 o'clock to read a story that would be appropriate for that grade level. And so if we as the church could line up volunteers for, um, parents or teachers in our church that need help knowing how to do this online uh, with their kids. Anytime that we can donate to a teacher or a parent, a family, to help with um, tutoring or reading. Reading is the easiest thing, then that seems to be really receptive. Um, I'm going to be volunteering to do tutoring in mathematics. I know people stay away from that. They don't want to do that. But parents don't want to do it either than, and don't really know how. So I'm going to uh, make myself available to do some tutoring. Um, and we will do it either online or, or you know, over the phone. We'll just have to modify what is needed by that um, particular parent and that child. So if the teacher lets me know that these parents are struggling with a particular thing, we can do a Zoom and we're all learning how to solve linear equations together. I'm open to that. Or if they want to just do two digit addition and that involves, you know, regrouping, whatever is simple. But I am going to make myself available to do with one, to tutor with one child, just to take the stress away about mathematics being so hard, I can't do it, or arithmetic is so hard, but I would encourage the teachers, I mean the churches, to um, get volunteers that are willing to give 30 minutes or an hour one day a week, but it needs to be the same hour every week to a group of kids. I mean, that's what we were doing when we were working with schools, but now that we're home and we have access to Zoom, that would be something that would be easy for us to do. And it'll give people at home that don't really have anything to do the opportunity to be a blessing to a child, uh, and I would say to their parents. So I wanted to lift that up. And people that want to know more about that can email me um, through the conference or call, and my cell is 213. 
880-7009. And I would love to have more conversation about that. Thank you, Estan. And um, let's keep in touch about uh, things that we're finding to um, kind of make that idea more broadly available as a kind of a yes. backup for our, our teachers around the, around the area. Yeah, um, great. absolutely. Other questions? Does the conference have any limitations on days schools that our churches can meet other than what the state and local government have implemented? I am not aware of that. Um, I would love to know what everybody, I'd love to know what everybody's doing with their schools because this is a big conversation I'm having with some of you as pastor friends about what the heck we're going to do with our schools. I've only heard of one school that's remaining open at Cathedral of Hope but maybe I'm misinformed. Are there others that are still open or what are people doing? So I asked the question because uh, my day school, the, the Grace obviously closed. They did an extended spring break, which includes this week and now they said they're doing a week after that. But I think that's just to comply with the April 3rd shelter in place order, which well, if I'm not mistaken, that's the only that's the time limit that uh, Judge Jenkins had that'll probably be extended, uh, we'll see. So um, the director of the Grace Day School, Open Door Preschool wanted to know if the conference had anything to say about when we could, they could start meeting again. Um, it's, it's almost, I don't know if it's a moot point, but they're just right now with all these new orders coming out, you know, she just wanted more information, but it looks like it's gonna be a while before Open Door Preschool gets to meet again. Um, so yeah, that was just one thing that, that I'm, that some people have been asking on my end, but obviously um, they're closed for a while. Jonathan, there is an exception on the, on the daycare provision for, um, daycares that are offering, um, services for healthcare providers that may apply to you because you're right down the street from, from Baylor, but I would recommend that Gretchen, you know, obviously contact the the city about that to be sure you're in compliance, but you may fit into that. Okay, thanks for now. The Boston Smith instituted that when they do open, they're gonna take everybody's temperature on the playground so no one's walking into the building with some, some safety steps like that. That's good to know. Thank you. I was gonna add to that, Jonathan. Um, so we, uh, our, our school went from 74 enrolled to only 13 enrolled at this time. And the whole, and we are in Dallas County and the, the criteria that our preschool director uh, sought out was that the kids that are being brought to our preschool program are only essential are kids of essential workers right now and that was actually before the announcement from Dallas County and so um, uh, yeah we, our preschool is only open for those kids right now and that's that was like a major uh, discussion we had about that yeah you know, we're kind of doing the same thing we have a smaller group of children there uh, for people who are essential workers and a smaller number of teachers there to be with them. And, um, but we are still functioning with that smaller group. I think it might be 20. Yeah, Plymouth Park and Irving's looking at a similar thing. Uh, we have uh, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. with our preschool that offers um, particularly for working families in our area. And so we're trying to explore right now between the city and the county. Um, what is essential? What are our uh, guidelines where we can follow uh, if we're keeping everything sanitized, staying within the daycare requirements of taking temperatures and getting everyone's documents signed? We also have a number of families who have uh, relatives in other areas and traveled over spring break out of the country. And so we've got to even figure out what families are self quarantining and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but we we're trying to figure out some ways um, to provide the working family. Uh, child care, uh, particularly for health care providers or other essential workers um, that have to be at work. And we could be one of those emergency daycare uh, facilities. Uh, a couple of follow-up questions. Um, and Scott um, Gillen um, mentions that, you know, temperature tests are only partially effective uh, because you can be asymptomatic 
um, and still be contagious. That's a good good note. Um, Jacob asked, "Do eviction does the eviction prohibition off, um, apply only to renters? And what about the homeowners?" I I don't know the specific answer to that. I I can ask around. I I know I happen to have access to somebody who will know. So I will uh, I can pass that along to you. Thanks. Other questions? Uh, some of your UMW um, members may have, <clears throat> um, Kathy says that she thinks that uh, where public funds come from on a HUD basis is where the f some of the federal orders may yeah, I think I didn't want to just jump in, but I Please. think I don't quote me on this, whoever was asking that question, but I think that um, the mortgages are the ones that are more restrictive as opposed to renters. And so the mortgages are looking all the way up to HUD and how it's financed. <clears throat> and I know I need to do more work on that, but um, I'm pretty sure that that's at, that there are different um, like foreclosures and things like that are coming from the national level as well. Right. And at a local level I mean, or at state level as well, um, remember that the county sheriff typically would be in charge of um, the eviction process in terms of showing up and evicting people, and they are not going to do that right now. That's correct. Okay. Okay. So some of your UMW um, uh, groups will have received an email from me uh, just as a, a quick note from kind of some things I am seeing. Um, some, a good surgeon friend of mine uh, here at Baylor Grapevine has kind of put out the call for masks. Uh, if people have hoarded the N95 masks um, to cough them up <laughs> and receive uh, some amnesty uh, to donate them to hospitals um, as a way to help, uh, but also uh, has some friends making um, masks out of cloth and some filter fabric if it's available um, as a backup. The CDC has issued their guidelines to uh, for personal protective equipment and that is kind of the last line of defense but unfortunately because our um, response has been so slow to provide protective equipment to our medical workers especially those in the front lines um, that may be what they have to resort to um, when the supply is is gone. Um, so Methodist Health Systems here in uh, Dallas will be accepting them. Uh, if you want more information on how to get those masks to them, let me know. Um, and uh, Baylor Grapevine have some contacts there. I've encouraged your you know, local UMW volunteers to reach out to their local health system, some of which are actively taking them, some are not, um, but those will be helpful at the very least for, you know, patients who are not there for, for COVID symptoms and need to be um, um, uh, protected to some extent. Uh, Edgar Bazan, uh, would you share what you just shared? Well, I just remember that I, I when I, I was hearing the news and uh, it, you know, they were giving this update, and uh, so I just you know copy and pasted what I what I found. So okay. it is right there. All right, FHA loans or what? Yeah, it's good. Yes, for the FHA yeah. loans. The question was asked about what particular, so that's what I know. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, Nick is saying that some friends are uh, 3D printing masks and some protective gear. Um, that's a really innovative approach. Nick, if you would uh, keep in touch with me about how that's going, if that's an idea that we could toss out there more. Right, Eric, um, 
Eric, you're right. Kerry Smith had gotten in touch with me. Baylor Dallas is not accepting uh, fabric masks at this time. Uh, but I would bet that there are probably some staff that if you contacted them individually would probably take them. Our, um, there's been a lot of criticism of hospital administrators for not being very forthcoming about uh, how they're protecting folks. Tom uh, Hudspeth, would you brief us about the African University situation? Uh, yes. The uh, yeah, African University has uh, closed their campus effective tomorrow. Uh, about sixty percent of their students are Zimbabwean students. Uh, they're having difficulties uh, making arrangements home. There are uh, uh, students who are trying to uh, get their place uh, back home. They're facing quarantine in some of their countries, such as the example in in Ghana. Uh, have a deaf student who's got who's going to be um, quarantined for two weeks, and uh, just as some a difficulty. My understanding from uh, from other sources that uh, and from the uh, uh, agency that uh, does a lot of booking for United Methodist board travel that Addis Ababa is the only uh, international airport in Africa that's um, still handling uh, transits for uh, international travel. Mm. Um, so um, I'll, I'll take a question, but that's uh, what I'm uh, seeing right now. <laughs> right, and Tom, I hope you'll um, you know, let us know if there are any things thing that we can do around that area. Um, I know a lot of our uh, ministry partners around the globe are perhaps in areas that may be that are not set up in the way that um, that we are to respond to this crisis, even if we are are slow to respond. And that's a real concern. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dale uh, Tamke, would you mention about the N95 masks? Sure. Uh, N95 masks, I, we, we had done some work projects and we bought boxes of N95 masks and they're often used for drywall work. And I uh, was able, I'm on the board of a, health, of a health clinic here in Denton where I live and they took the masks because they're the same masks that are used uh, clinically. So if you got them in your work project supplies or in your work, you know, your work trailers or, you know, anything like that, it'd be probably worth it to round them up and see if you've got a, a local health uh, clinic that could use them. So that's just my suggestion. We're going to do a little drive with our folks and see who's got those. We've got a bunch of guys that like to do some their own, you know, DIY, DIY work. And uh, and you can't get them at Home Depot. I mean, I, we tried to buy them and uh, they're really in short supply. So anyway, just an idea for folks. Right, that, that would be a really great way to um, uh, get people involved if they can uh, find any of those masks, even if they were uh, ones that hoarded them and get those to where they need to be. Uh, Eric, would you share about Wes? Yeah, just, just to follow up on what Tom said, I've been talking with Wes Magruder, who I know we all know, and the general board has apparently invited all of the uh, foreign missionaries to consider coming home. I, I don't know if y'all have heard that and has, offered to get them flights, and then they sent a message back to Wes and said, oh, too bad, we can't find a way to get you home. So he was considering coming back and now can't. So just, I know a lot of y'all know Wes, you might want to check in with him. It's a kind of a stressful, t it's stressful for everybody, but he's feeling particularly cut off right now. Mm. Thank you, Eric. Any other questions? So I'm, I'm thinking- one more, one more clarification. Uh, I, I have been told by uh, reputable legal authority, all evictions, rentals and, um, and ownerships uh, are currently covered by the Supreme Court's order. I'm pr pretty confident that's good information. Thank you, Eric. 
Uh, so what, what other connections need to happen um, around these conversations? Um, what I'm seeing in these, in hearing in these conversations is that there are a number of kind of um, informational points that we can be helpful in pushing out to you as being a reference point. Um, <laughs> um, as being a reference point for those of you uh, who might need resources to push out. Uh, but then also there are some that are working around specific areas like advocacy, like domestic violence uh, situations, uh, like food and hunger um, and volunteer recruitment that some of these conversations um, might need to keep going and be stoked as kind of a working group uh, informally. Uh, does that sound right? Are there other ideas or connections that, that y'all are seeing that we need to be doing? Other encouragement uh, and support that we can provide as the Center for Missional Outreach for y'all's work. You know, I think uh, it's probably just conference office in general. I think anytime that there's uh, extension of deadlines of uh, encouragements from the bishop, anytime there's um, state updates, any <clears throat> encouragement from the conference office is helpful. Um, I know for all of our congregations, anything that comes from the weight of the office of the bishop is going to help for folks. I think it's beginning to get spread in the culture enough that there are fewer and fewer people who are saying, oh, this isn't a big deal. Why are we doing this? But, uh, you know, I'm only eight and a half months into a new appointment. It always is helpful in a crazy adjustment of things to say, hey, the bishop's asking us to do this. The conference is asking us to do this. Those are helpful encouragements anytime we can have that kind of communication, which I know y'all are working a ton on, but just adding that voice to it. Hey, Andrew, and I, I might jump in and say, um, my brother is a local pastor in the Memphis conference. And mm. uh, uh, the, the one thought that for him, he has a member who passed away. And so he had to have a real awkward conversation about not having a funeral at the church. And so maybe that hasn't happened here yet, but to think about that, to pray for those conversations that are having to happen. Um, they haven't figured out what the resolution to that's gonna be yet, but I would imagine we are gonna have something like that happen here soon. So just to keep those who are gonna be in those kind of awkward situations in, in our prayers. I can speak to that just to give a sense of what's coming. Um, Oklahoma United Methodist Church had a funeral this past week. Uh, just a couple of days ago, I think Saturday, maybe Friday, uh, for someone who was killed by in a hit and run situation. So that had nothing to do with COVID-19, but um, the funeral had to be done at the funeral home. They had a limitation of fewer than 10 people there. And so one of the things Oak Lawn did that I thought was really beautiful is um, congregation members who wanted to attend but couldn't be there in person um, sent headshots to someone at the church who then printed all of them out and then had all of those headshots sitting in chairs um, in, the, in the room where the funeral was happening. So the family had a sense of, um, you know, all the other people who wanted to be there and who are watching via live stream. Um, so it's just, a, I think, a creative and beautiful way for them to, um, yeah, have the congregation present in the midst of it. Um, and uh, from what I'm hearing from folks, I've got a couple of folks in my congregation who work at UT Southwestern as assistant professor, some others who are involved in Baylor Medical and folks like that. Um, lots of funerals are coming, friends. Lots of them. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be helpful for those of us who um, can post ideas like that for us to be able to help uh, one another grieve and navigate these really tough situations. Um, that's a, going to be a huge area of ministry that is going to um, weigh on our churches, uh, but also uh, those of us who are frontline pastors uh, who are, are going to uh, lose people that we love and know in our congregations. Andrew, mm -hmm. I would like to highlight that on Wednesday, the um, 
CCD will be having a webinar Zoom call to get ready for uh, how we do worship. You know, a lot of pastors are doing it for the first time. A lot of pastors did um, a different thing the second Sunday. So we're going to have uh, that and it'll be set up kind of like this where people can, uh, after we're hearing three speakers, uh, get, get your feedback. And so this is a service that the conference is, uh, is offering, you know, how to really do online worship and how to plan it. Whether you don't want to be on the camera, you can record it before and then drop it the day of worship. All of those kinds of things will be covered. So um, I know Deborah Mason sent that out to the Metro District pastors. We want everyone to know about that. I'm going to put it on my Facebook page. Uh, it's on our conference page. It's on War uh, Owen's Facebook page. And so we would like to invite you to come to that tomorrow, starting at one o'clock. And please bring your laity because they're the ones to help uh, lead that. And if you are a pastor that you're the only one there, it would be great to have a lay leader or someone with you on this Zoom call. So uh, Wednesday, one o'clock, uh, how to do worship online. I lift that up as for uh, a support from our center. Thank you, Estaina. And uh, I imagine there will be a lot of opportunities uh, coming up that will be accessible via Zoom. Uh, and yes. there's some great um, other feedback about funerals. Um, you know, Mike is saying that uh, most funeral homes um, will probably be allowed to host funerals, but it'll be limited to 10, mm -hmm. you know, at least for now. Uh, in Italy, uh, there are even stricter uh, limitations. And um, the sad reality is that many funeral homes in local areas are, are packed and not mm -hmm. able to accept uh, the numbers that are needed. Um, so we'll try to do some research on that and, and find practices. If you have any other ideas, please uh, let us know uh, for that. And now uh, it is 1130. So I want to be good stewards of our time. Um, there's some conversation about us having a call perhaps next week uh, to kind of check back in. And as things are developing uh, for us to um, come back together and, and record that as well. Um, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your ministry. And um, this is an unusual situation. And uh, um, difficult days are ahead. But I know that God is with us uh, night and morning and never, never fails to greet us each new day, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said. So God bless you. And uh, if you have any other questions, ideas, uh, let me know. Um, and I will uh, try to respond to some of the areas of, of uh, networking that have been mentioned today and get that out. This will be recorded and posted to our website hopefully soon. Thank you all and um, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye everybody.